A friend of mine once told me, listen, you keep telling people about animals, aren't you tired of this by this point? And then I told him, penguins walk while squatting. Today, you'll find out how fish inflate after drinking water, why birds have the scariest teeth on the planet, and what scorpions and elven weapons have in common. <laughs> Everyone knows what polar bears look like. They're white, white fur, white skin, black nose, a standard set. But if you start looking into it, you'll find out that we've been lied to our whole life. Well, except for the nose part. In fact, all polar bears have black skin, straight up black. And this is quite a logical evolutionary step, which obviously took animals a long time to make. An obvious fact, black is the best color to absorb the sun energy. When you live in the Arctic Circle, you really need to obtain heat from somewhere, and the sun is a great source. That's why white bears got dark skin. But why wouldn't they also grow black fur? Well, this would certainly ruin their disguise. But the black color has many benefits, doesn't it? Like I said, our entire life has been a lie, and the polar bear's white fur is actually transparent. I don't know what to call these guys now. Black transparent bears? Hair gets its color from pigment. Different types of pigment form in different amounts to create different colors when light hits them. Have you seen how paint is mixed? That's roughly how it works here. But there's no pigment in the polar bear's fur at all. Its hairs are hollow, like straws, and there's enough space inside them to scatter the light. When bears stand in the sun and all the light bounces off them, they look white, so it's a nice adaptation. All right, polar bears aren't actually white. What's next, salmon meat is an orange? Huh? Why, why are you waving at me, Steve? What? What do you mean it's not orange? What? What the f Okay, the good news is that wild salmon does indeed have the reddish coral shade we're used to. This color is caused by fish diet, which consists of shrimp and krill. They contain a reddish-orange compound called astaxanthin, the same stuff that makes flamingos pink, by the way. But farmed salmon eats only what people give them, which is usually a mix of smaller fish, soybeans, corn gluten, chicken fat, and God knows what else. Some manufacturers do add crustaceans to this mix, but others simply use astaxanthin in pellets. This is how the meat of farm salmon acquires the same color as wild salmon. Although, in fact, it's grayish. That is, it's really colored. Otherwise, no one will buy it. People who still think penguins are cute, funny, chubby guys who also walk in a funny way have no idea what these birds are capable of. However, I've already talked about harsh rules among penguins in other videos. Today, we'll look into their mouths to see their teeth. So what, some of the viewers might say, it's a mouth, it's supposed to have teeth. Well, first, birds do not have real teeth, and second, if they did, they'd definitely not be located on their tongue and palate. Peek into the penguin's beak, and you'll see a scene from a horror movie. Damn, nature, you scary. Of course, these aren't real teeth. That is, they're definitely not like the teeth that we and other animals have. These structures on the tongue and palate are actually made up of soft keratin spikes called papillae. They seem sharp and curve back towards the back of the mouth. By the way, camels have the same spikes, also tough and scary looking. Those spikes work a little like a fish hook, or rather like a mouth covered with hooks. When a bird snatches its prey, it has only one way to go, down the throat. In short, this is a tool for more successful fishing, and perhaps to intimidate sensitive people. But don't quote me on that. Now let's leave the penguin's beaks alone and examine these animals all over. Have you ever thought about their anatomy? I mean, what's inside them? How do these ridiculous birds even walk with their short neck, short legs, flippers, stubby something instead of a normal tail? But once you see a penguin skeleton in some museum, you get quite a different idea. Penguins have knees. You just can't see them because penguins don't use their knees for walking as humans do. They can use them to swim, slide on ice, and incubate eggs. Yeah, penguins literally hold the eggs with their knees. Actually, if you look at the penguin skeleton, you'll see these birds walk as if always squatting. Actually, this position is not very convenient. Moreover, it's generally uncomfortable. Hardly any penguins would have a chance to ever become a football player. Though penguins have real tails, penguins even have elbows. However, the bones of the wings fuse together. 
so penguins can only move their flippers from the shoulders. Also, if you can call the distance from the shoulders to the head and neck, you'll see penguins have a damn long one. Swimming in cold water made the bodies of these birds very special. Ever seen the petrels? Not only do these aggressive birds make incredibly long migrations across the planet, have scary-looking beaks, and spit vile, stinky bile at their opponents, they also walk on water. You can see this when they're eating, but the best thing is when the petrels run across the ocean about to take off. This is common for giant petrels and, for example, blue petrels. That is, the size doesn't really matter here. To take off, these birds need a long airstrip on the surface of the ocean. Yes, they literally run on the water and only then rise into the air. Of course, this is no easy task, so petrels sometimes have to stop and rest if they fail to take off from the first attempt. Moreover, this happens even when the petrel tries to take off not from the water, but also from some inclined surface. Imagine how this huge, proud, free bird keeps running and then... Some discoveries are made by destroying old myths, some to test theories, some are made by chance. But why in the hell would anyone think of checking if pigs can breathe through their butt? Spoiler, yes they can, just like mice and rats. Scientists discovered this by pumping oxygen into animals from behind. Science rules. Why run such experiments, you ask? The research team wanted to find an alternative to mechanical ventilation. You know, this issue's become quite relevant lately. First, scientists looked at sea cucumbers and freshwater fish called loaches. They all used their intestines for respiration, but that wasn't enough. And then they found mammals breathing through their anus. I doubt YouTube will be happy if we start describing all their research in detail. In short, the animals were placed in an environment with low oxygen content to see how long they can last with and without intestinal respiration. In addition to gas, they used oxygenated liquids and stuff like that, though it didn't make much difference. The fact remains that mice, rats, and pigs can breathe through the anus. And maybe one day we can too. Now you'll just have to live with this information. But while researchers haven't got to the human guts yet, let's take a look at wombats. They're generally quite cute and so chubby, like big thick hamsters. I know, I know, wombats are marsupials, but that's not the point here. The thing is, wombat droppings have a cubic shape, and people found out why only in 2018. Maybe scientists had more important things to do. So wombats can pass up to 100 cubes per night? They use these cubes, among other things, to mark the territory, but the shape simply helps the feces not to roll away in different directions. To create the cubes, wombats upgraded their intestines, so the elastic gut walls help shape the cubes inside. Well, what can I say? I think a geometry teacher would be delighted. Nice. You've probably heard that puffer fish can inflate. Maybe you even saw the ordinary fish, which was just swimming a second ago, suddenly went poof and turned into a sphere with a bunch of sharp spikes. I always thought puffer fish inflate, well, like balloons, just taking in some air. Turns out that holding your breath has nothing to do with it. Researchers found out that puffer fish can breathe normally even when inflated. Moreover, it uses gills. An incredibly elastic stomach is inflated when puffer fish fills it with water over several large gulps. You know, when I'm really thirsty, I can drink several glasses of water in a row. At moments like this, you definitely feel like a puffer fish. Sometimes, poor fish have to make 10 to 15 gulps of seawater to turn into a prickly ball, and this, of course, requires effort. Scientists have even estimated that an inflated puffer fish consumes five times more oxygen. It then takes an average of 5.6 hours before the puffer fish can return to its typical metabolism. It's like jogging. After you do it, you just need a little time to catch your breath and recover. At such times, puffer fish are easy prey to predators, despite being poisonous. All these fish can do when threatened is turn into a prickly ball or suddenly switch to warp speed. None of these is any good when the animal's exhausted. It seems to me that compared to puffer fish, scorpions are doing quite well. They have pinchers, a venomous sting, some even come with a spray function. They got a tail they can discard and grow a new one then. Plus, scorpions move at a speed of about 12 miles per hour, which means they can easily evade the enemy or run away. They also 
glow under UV light. This is quite weird. And scientists are still not completely certain why scorpions have this ability. Douglas Gaffin of the University of Oklahoma believes that scorpions glow to convert the dim UV light of the moon and stars into the color they see best. That is, blue-green. I mean, they glow to be able to see themselves? But why? So that scorpions know exactly whether they can be seen or not. Yes, they literally look at themselves, see they're glowing, and realize they're exposed, and it's about time to crawl into the shadows. Remember the sting? The blade that Frodo carried? The blade glowed if there was danger nearby. That is, orcs. Scorpions work almost the same way. Is there any conclusion we can make from this? Well, if you ever need to find a scorpion, go out in the desert at night with a UV lamp. But to be honest, I'm not a fan of these creatures. I'd rather look at some birds. Oh there, a region honey eater. It can only be found in Australia, but like many endemic species, it's in serious trouble. Well, it's endangered. Regent honey eaters are known for their complicated mating songs, and this is one of the problems of their species. As the population of these birds began to decline, ornithologists noticed the complexity of the songs decreased so much that male regent honey eaters stopped sounding like they used to. They began to imitate the songs of other bird species because they simply couldn't learn their own. That's how the mating songs of regent honey eaters have become the rarest in the world. Would you like to listen to it? Well, since the birds themselves can't demonstrate it, someone else has to. <laughs> Scientists used to think regent honey eaters imitate other birds' voices in order to hide from predators, but actually the poor birds simply forgot their own songs. Usually, young birds learn from adults, but today there's simply no one to learn from. There are only 350 to 400 birds left. It's like the memories of the entire species were wiped out. Uh, huh? What happened? Where am I? Steve. Right, here's the script. <clears throat> Perhaps Regent honey eaters would somehow make do with songs of other birds. After all, they can also be quite beautiful. But the whole problem is the females want to hear, well, original tracks, not covers on some cuckoos. All this greatly reduces the chances of Regent honey eaters to find a mate. But there's good news. People began to breed these rare birds in captivity, teach them the right songs, and then release and carefully check on them. So far, it's going well. See you later.